Hello, here is the unit on plant form and function that will consist of a series of videos covering chapters 35 through 39. So here's your basic plant consisting of the root and the shoot, the root and the ground, obviously, um, whose job is to anchor the plant in the ground and also to absorb water and nutrients from the soil. The shoot above ground the portion that holds the leaves, leaves up to the sun so, so photosynthesis can happen also has the flowers that will develop into the fruits and um, to get those flowers out there so pollinators can get to them. <clears throat> Plants uh, have what we describe as a modular form of growth or an indeterminate form of growth in which these modules consisting of the nodes and inner node are just added one onto the other the node is where uh, things, leaves, flowers, are attached to the stem. And the internode is just the space between nodes. Let's see. So here is your basic seed that's germinating. What I want you to notice here is all these little hairs on this, on this root. And these are known as the root hairs and they increase the surface area of the root, allowing it to absorb more nutrients. Now beyond this basic structure here, we have some variations. Um, one is that sometimes the stem of a plant doesn't go up, but it goes laterally across the ground, um, sometimes just under the ground, and this kind of stem is known as a, a rhizome. Here you can see the leaves growing up out of the uh, off the rhizome and the root growing down. So your basic leaf consists of the leaf blade and the leaf stem, otherwise known as the petiole. And we'll talk about these axillary buds. These are buds that are sort of wedged in at the nodes. Sometimes leaves are modified though. Here we have in these pea plants, some that have become tendrils for grabbing onto thing, obviously common in vines uh, in particular. Sometimes leaves take on a reproductive role. In this case with clancho, we have some clanchos in the classroom where on the margins of the leaf or the edge of the leaf, you have these little plantlets that uh, develop and will fall off. This is a form of asexual reproduction. So <clears throat> just like in animals, in plants you have tissues. You don't have as many different types in plants. You have three, the dermal, ground, and vascular. Dermal makes up the covering of the plant, the outer layer of cells. Vascular tissue consists of xylem and phloem. We'll talk about their jobs a little later. And then the ground tissue is everything else, which comes, which has a very variety of jobs depending on where it's located in the plant. So for example, in the stem, we can see we've got dermal or epidermis on the outside. We've got these vascular bundles the vascular tissue, and then everything else is the ground tissue. <clears throat> Excuse me, in the case of the stems, then it's known as the pith, and these cells typically have the job of providing support or, and or storage of materials, water or food, for example. <clears throat> now in the leaf, we see we have again the epidermis, dermal tissue, We've got the vascular tissue, these vascular bundles, and then we've got the ground tissue all around. Here the ground tissue's major job is to carry out photosynthesis, so these cells that carry out photosynthesis are known as the mesophyll cells. A couple different types, we have these long cylinder shaped ones known as the palisades mesophyll, and then the spongy down below, you can see in this cross section of a, one that's been stained, this, all this space here amongst the spongy mesophyll, not so much with the palisades. You should notice in the epidermis we have some modified cells, the guard cells, um, which together uh, form an opening here known as the stoma. This allows for gas exchange in and out of the leaf. Here we have some modified uh, cells, um, part of the ground tissue, the sclerenchyma. We'll talk about them a little more later, but they provide a support role. Often they're found next to vascular bundles. So with ground tissue here on the left, um, they sort of start out as what we call parenchyma cells, which are relatively undifferentiated cells that have 
a thick, a thin cell wall um, in leaves there are the ones that are doing the photosynthesis for example and the stem they'd be the ones that are doing storage now parenchyma cells can develop a thicker cell wall and become clinkyma cells and take on more of a support role and then other times they can develop a really thick cell wall if you look at these cells there's just a tiny little spot on the inside most of that cell consists of a wall and so that cell has a very much a support role these sclerenchyma cells vascular tissue uh, xylem and phloem xylem consisting of these relatively short wider ones called vessel elements and these longer thinner ones called tracheids and these cells are just stacked one on top of the other forming a tube and xylem cells when they're functioning are dead they're just these again cells stacked up that form a tube now the phloem consist of the sieve tubes and the companion cells and they're alive at when they're functioning and we'll see a little later how the companion cells help with moving the sugar solution into the phloem cells so that it can move around the plant all right how do plants grow um, well they have meristems and there are meristems at the tips of shoots and roots these are known as the apical meristems and then you have lateral meristems the meristems grow just by adding on new cells and particularly at the apical meristems it's like a, a building getting taller you're adding more and more bricks to get this thing taller and taller and that's what happens here you just add on more and more cells to cause the plant to get taller or the roots to get longer now how do plants get wider well um plants that do get wider particularly woody plants will have a lateral meristem a couple of them you'll have the uh, vascular cambium which is a a um, think of this as a sort of a cylinder that runs up and down the plant and so this vascular cambium produces new vascular cells new xylem and phloem we also have the cork cambium which is a meristem that produces cork or the outer layer of the bark just like your skin certain cells are lost throughout the day and all the time you have to make new ones well that's what happens to the bark it gets shed after a while and you have to make more of it so again here's that apical meristem active cell division here notice this so this would be a node here we've got some leaves attached and we've got those axillary buds uh, we'll talk a little later about how the apical bud here the apical meristem basically suppresses the growth of these axillary buds and concentrates resources and cell division and growth at that tip which causes the plant to get taller and taller <clears throat> Whoops. so again here we are with that uh, the lateral meristems the vascular cambium producing xylem vessels to the inside phloem to the outside and this is what causes again the plant to get wider and wider and where what causes the growth rings to develop in woody plants and here's that uh, cork cambium producing cork the outer layer of the bark so what happens is, again the vascular cambium produces these new cells xylem to the inside phloem to the outside and so it's just adding these on and adding these on and in particular it happens more rapidly early in the season when there's lots of rain and growth is occurring rapidly and so that's when the new ring will develop um, by the vascular cambium producing these xylem cells and phloem so the xylem gets deposited on inside and so as the tree gets wider and wider you have older and older xylem cells deeper inside the tree trunk it's just the outer layer that are involved with transporting water those inner ones have turned into what we call wood and so wood just consists of mostly a bunch of old dead xylem cells with lots of cellulose in them and their main job is to provide support for the tree so how do we move water around a tree up up in hundreds of feet in the air well it's a rather amazing process that takes advantage of the properties of water of course water being drawn in through the roots and there's minerals dissolved in the water traveling up the plant and then out the leaves in the process of transpiration of course co2 is taken up in the leaves the oxygen giving off through photosynthesis is released 
Sugars produced are transported around the plant to where they're needed or can be stored. Notice down in the roots we have the opposite going on with oxygen and CO2. We're taking in oxygen and releasing CO2. We have to take in oxygen because you don't have any photosynthesis going on here, but of course you have cellular respiration, so you need oxygen, and then the CO2 released has to be given off. Plants, um, like all organisms, take uh, advantage of um, active transport. Again, of course, they have cell membranes, and so things that have a charge can't get across it, so they have to move through these protein channels. And so you can use active transport, as we talked about, with these proton pumps to concentrate these hydrogen ions on the outside of a, a cell or outside of the root. And then what will happen is <clears throat> those hydrogen ions will want to come back in, and you can use this to co-transport um, for example, these nitrate ions into the cells. And so, like all organisms as well, plants do not pump water around, but they move ions around and they get the water to follow, follow along. And they take advantage of what's known as the uh, water potential. And the water potential consists of the pressure potential and the solute potential. And so you see here, in pure water, you have no solute and no pressure in this open container, so you have a water potential of zero. But in the cell, we, of course, have some solutes in here, and so that leads to a negative solute potential, which leads to a negative water potential. If we take this cell and stick it into a solution that has an even more negative or lower water potential, because this solution has more solutes, the water leaves because it wants to go from where there's more water to where there's less of it, or from the um, from the hypotonic to the hypertonic solution. The solution surrounding it is hypertonic because it has more solutes and a lower water potential. Take the same cell and put it in pure water. Now we have the hypotonic solution surrounding this cell. The inside of the cell is hypertonic, and water is absorbed. Now because of the cell wall, that restrains the pressure inside that cell, so now the pressure potential rises, and eventually the cell will reach equilibrium with the surroundings. In both cases it will, either by gaining or losing water. <coughs> okay, water can, water, when we're in the roots, um, water can take a couple different uh, pathways into the root. It can move along the cell walls between the cells, or it can pass through the cells. Now, eventually, it reach, reaches a region uh, deeper in the root, known as the endodermis, which is a layer of cells that surrounds the vascular tissue in the center. And these endodermal cells are surrounded by um, this material, this wax material known as the Casparian strip. And this makes this space here watertight, so the water cannot move through there between the cells, but is forced into the cells of the endodermis. The plant does this because it wants to use its ability to transport ions around to control what's getting into the vascular tissue. And so the water is forced through the endodermal cells and then it can potentially pass into the center going through these cells, not just around them. Again, it's a way to control what's getting into the vascular bundle. So, I'll come back to that in just the center in a minute. <clears throat> in fact, I think this is the next slide show picks this up, so I will stop here. Thanks.